Hey, that's cool. The postman just dropped off that kid I purchased off of eBay. Yep, shouldn't be too long before I get to this one. <sighs> well, at least I was finally able to get to it. Well, let's crack this guy open and start it. With those other builds out of the way, this guy should be a breeze. Hmm. Looks pretty straightforward. Yep. Yeah. Shouldn't be too long before I have this guy fully completed. Well, better late than never. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale M60A1 Rise with the M9 dozer blade. Now the model that we have here is built from my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these model showcase videos, I often take on commission built projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, this information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. Now, by and large, this build here is predominantly built out of the box. However, unlike many of the other built out of the box builds that are showcased on the channel, this one here did receive quite a few extra detail modifications and fittings. In addition to those, I also went ahead and modified the model to have some key certain functional aspects to it. We'll be going over all of these modifications in this video, not least of which will also be reviewing the base starter kit itself. So stay tuned because there's going to be a lot of content coming at you. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the M60A1 Rise main battle tank with the M9 dozer blade kit attached. As most people know, the M60A1 main battle tank was the mainstay of the US military's armored corps force from the late 1960s up until the mid 1980s. At this point, the US Army adopted the brand new M1 Abrams main battle tank, and this was going to be the vehicle that was going to be the Army's mainstay in its Armored Corps fleet. However, the US Marine Corps still decided to keep the M60A1, and they basically utilized it up until the mid 1990s. Now, although the M1 Abrams was the frontline American tank for the Armored Corps, the U.S. Army still widely kept and utilized the M60 in its various configurations. There was still a large number of these vehicles on hand, plus a humongous inventory of spare parts to keep these vehicles running for the foreseeable future. Many units in the U.S. Army don't necessarily need to have the M1 Abrams at that time, and so many units such as Army National Guard, as well as Army Reservists, still retained and trained and kept their M60 main battle tanks. However, by the mid-1990s, both the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marine Corps decided to retire and phase out the M60 family altogether. By this point, the vehicles were beginning to start showing their age, and the U.S. military had a sufficient stockpile of M1 Abrams and M1 Abrams spare parts to keep the vehicles up and running for all of the armored units that were available. The M60 really was a product of the era it was designed in. You have to keep in mind that this is a late 1950s, early 1960s tank design and utilizes all of the design cues and materials that were commonplace during that era. This is specifically true for the tank's armor protection. The M60 utilizes a lot of components which are made in cast armor quality steel. Although this type of material is quite commonplace on tank armor of the period, it was susceptible to a shape charge weapon, and unfortunately for the West, the Russians had a very good system for this. The Russians, seeing what they learned on the Eastern Front during World War II, took the concept of the shape charge projectile and ran with it during the 1950s and 60s, accumulating with the RPG-7 and the Sager. Both of these weapon systems were used to great effect on vehicles like the M60 during the Yom Kippur War where the Israelis did lose a good number of both Centurions and M60s to these two platforms. At this point many analysts decided that this was the end of the tank and the vehicle was basically a lumbering obsolete 
icon of the past. However, there was a new breakthrough in the late 1970s and in the early 1980s, which was known as the ERA, or Explosive Reactive Armor. What the ERA is, is that you have these blocks that are suspended over the tank's main armor. In these blocks contain some steel plates and some C4 explosives. Basically, the way it works is that when the shape charge projectile, like an RPG or a Sagger, makes contact with the surface of the ERA, the C4 detonates, which would propel that steel plate towards the projectile, thus knocking it out of the way and diffusing and diminishing the effectiveness of the shape charge cone. Once this unit is expelled, the main armor is still in place and is not penetrated. The best part about this system is that it is a cheap and efficient retrofit that can be added to existing vehicles without having to do too much extensive modification. During the 1980s and into the 90s, a large number of the M60s that were in the inventory of the US military were upgraded with this new system, giving it better armor protection compared to its original version. It was this type of version of the M60 which did see combat with the US military in the first Gulf War. Now aside from all of that, you'll also notice that this vehicle is fitted with the M9 dozer blade. The M9 was a attachment kit designed for the M48 Patton as well as the M60 main battle tank. And it's a way to upgrade a standard main battle tank to have a bulldozer capability. Why this is important is quite simple. A lot of times you will encounter some sort of an obstacle that needs to be either pushed out of the way or you need to plow through a rampart of some sort, which otherwise would bog and slow you down. This is definitely something that's less than ideal, specifically if you're in combat, you need to keep moving or else you're basically a sitting duck. One advantage that this type of setup has is that you do not sacrifice one of the vehicles in the platoon. The vehicle still can act as a standard main battle tank, but has the extra added capability of being able to do other tasks, as opposed to it attaching to the unit some kind of engineering vehicle which is great for certain applications but is not really designed to be used as a tank first and foremost. Another benefit of this type of system is that since the vehicle being upgraded is one of the other type of tanks in the unit, it can still keep up with the pace of the rest of the main battle tanks. The concept of taking a standard tank and adding a bulldozer blade to it goes all the way back to World War II with the British Funnies as well as with the US versions of the M4 Sherman. The concept was a good idea back then and has stayed in continuous use even up through till today. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started to get a good idea on what the base starter kit was like as well as also the condition the model was in at the start of this build. And here's the model at the start of the build. Now, like what was shown in the pre-video bumper, this model here is one that should have been built, painted, and actually posted on this channel a number of years ago, but never progressed past the point that you see it here, and I'll go over that in a second. Now, the model started off as a 135th scale Academy M60A1 Rise with the M9 Doser Blade Kit. The box art is this one that we have here. Now, this particular model here, I purchased off of eBay back in 2009 and has been sitting in the stash for a number of years after that. About four or even six years ago, I went ahead and started to build the model up, but encountered a small little snag that I'll again go over as I describe the kit contents. Now, the basic kit itself, I'm not gonna go too much into the history of because unfortunately I filmed all that information many years ago when the model first started, but that memory card was corrupted eons ago and that information is lost to, this, to the sands of time. Basically, back in 1998, Academy released this kit here. Now, Academy is no stranger to the 135th scale M60A1 as they released this model back in, I want to say the early 1990s. That kit is nothing more than a copy of the Tamiya M60A1 model that goes all the way back to the 1970s. Although, unlike the Tamiya one, Academy did add some small, certain subtle changes to it that differentiates itself from the Tamiya offering. But 
By and large, this kit here is nothing more than a, to me, a knockoff, essentially. Now, it's also important to point out that since the 1990s, Academy has frequently re-released this kit here under many different skies. Most recently is an M60A2 Starship and also the Israeli variant with the armor that is on the turret. The name escapes me at the moment, but they do make that version as well. All of the Academy versions utilize the same upper and lower hull components and also the tar parts that we have here. Now from there this brings us to the actual build itself. Here you can see the model in a pretty much almost ready to paint configuration. Now the model is not totally as it seems. I actually wanted to do something special with this one as opposed to just building it static and uh, mostly out of the box. This model here actually has something under the hood. You see unlike most of the other builds that I do, this one here is actually fully motorized. Here you can see the motorization system that was fitted to this build. Now the gearbox is the Tamiya dual motor gearbox which is a unit that I've used on several other of these motorization conversions in the past and I gotta say it is a phenomenal gearbox. The unit is nice and strong, it runs very well, very reliably and gives you more than enough power to propel the vehicle. Also with it being dual motor gears or I should say dual motor drive, this does have the opportunity, if you're clever enough, to rig it to radio controlled configuration. Now for this model here, that's not gonna be the case. It's just gonna be basically motorized without any sort of control apparatus whatsoever. Perhaps I might try something down the road, but for now, this one, for the purposes of this build, I'm just gonna make it motorized. Now, I gotta say that of all of the 135th scale kits on the market, be from Tamiya or Academy, the Patton and the M60 series of kits are by and large the easiest models to motorize convert. The, the hulls are nice and wide, which is by the way, the only limiting factor to this gearbox is the width, of course, as well as even a little bit of the height. And on the M60 platform, as well as the M48 platform, you have enough ample clearance for both accounts. The gearbox simply was adapted to fit inside this hull here. Of course, I reutilized some of the motorization final drives, which come on these Tamiya pattern M60s, and the unit was bolted directly to the lower hull. Here we have on the inside a small power switch. Notice that nothing descends from the bottom of the hull. This was done so that the lower, the, the lower hull is nice and smooth of any sort of obstructions. And in order to power the tank on, you just use a small screwdriver or a toothpick of some sort or another to just hit the switch, which will power the unit. For the power supply, the model is actually powered by two AA batteries that we have right here in this removable cluster. The unit just clips together, like so, and the wire just tuck into the model, and then when you hit the switch, the, mo the motors will turn on and your tank is ready to roll. Now keep in mind all this would be done from the turret hole in regards to the battery insertion and removal. Now while on that note, one of the nice features found on the Academy rendition of the M60 as opposed to the Tamiya one and this is actually a really good improvement, it has to do with the lower hull. If you look at a Tamiya M60A1 or an M60A3 kit, you'll have these very two large ovals on either sides here of the lower hull. These, ho these large ovals, I believe, were originally intended for the two-way wire remote wire to come out of the bottom, but realistically they were rather unneeded and have been an eyesore and a ding on the Tamiya kits really since the get-go. There are a lot of options out there to plug them up. Several people use sheets of styrene or I believe there was even a resin aftermarket set which just drops in and f does most of the fill work for you. Academy went ahead and tweaked the tooling to the way you see it pretty much here. Just sands this slot as well as this 
slot screw, and the bottoms are much more refined. Now keep in mind there's still a motorization gearbox fitting hole found in this section here because Academy also released their kits in a motorized and two-way wire remote fashion as well. So that they kept, but the two large gaping holes were deleted as well as the little switch slot, which would have been ironically located in the same spot that I located this one here. That was also phased out as well. The halls are still exactly the same where you have the bathtub appearance with these two little sections that got to get glued on. And if you're, and of course, if you're building one of these models, this is going to be a area of seam work that you are going to have to contend with. But this is true for basically every single patent kit on the market that I could think of. The dragons included for that matter. On the front here, I replaced the plastic inserts for the wheel axles with one made from a brass rod. This of course was done because of the motorizational use. You want to have something a little bit more robust to deal with the rigors of the running compared to the standard plastic pegs. The pegs will work, but in my opinion, just the metal rod is more suffice. In fact, Tamiya even knows this as well because they give you a metal rod on their kits, which again is just a carryover from their earlier renditions. While on the interior section, another difference that I've seen from the Academy kits compared to the Tamiya is Academy omitted the little driver interior section that is found on the Tamiya kits. On the Tamiya model, there's a small little rectangular plate with some very basic and really rudimentary interior detailing of a driver's seat as well as some, I believe they're fire extinguisher bottles of some sort or another. Regardless of what they are, they were always kind of pointless on the Tamiya model and on the Academy kit, they 1086 did. But I, oddly enough, the remnants are still there where the piece would drop in. Moving further back takes us to the taillights. You'll notice that on the Academy kit, the taillights are better detailed compared to the Tamiya rendition. Now, I'm not sure about the Tamiya M60A1 with the reactive armor set, as I believe Tamiya upgraded that kit. But for the M60A3 kit, as well as the original 1970s era M60A1 kit, these were just two amorphous blobs without any detailing on them for the cat's eye. From there brings us to the rear sprockets. Now if you notice, the sprockets are not left stock. I went ahead and needed to add a spacer in these two sections over here to make them properly fit the track. Now this kit does give you several sprocket options from the original Detailless units from the 70s, which again from the Tamiya, as well as also another nicely detailed set Which have the external detailing as the ones that you see here, but I'm not sure if they would have been the correct width or not I presume that they would be for some reason these ones were a little bit too thin, but were not an issue I went ahead and just machined two new spacers out of turned resin which give you the appropriate width of the sprocket if I take a track and fit it on, you can see that the timing matches up absolutely perfectly. Another one of the more unique features that the Academy kit did, and this is where it starts differing from the Tamiya, are with the road wheels. Now, both the Tamiya and the Academy kits utilize a polycap wheel design, which is quite standard, but when Academy went ahead and retooled the kit, they went ahead and gave it the M48 pattern of road wheels. The M60, of course, would have originally had a, its own design of a cast aluminum road wheel, which has a different face compared to the stamped ones, which have these little spokes that are integrally casted in. And these, this detail pattern is found on the older Tamiya counterparts. However, one of the dings that that design had was that the poly cap was actually the hub cap molded in and you would put the wheel on and put the poly cap in place. This does work very well, but one of the dings that these kits always had was that you had this seam line around the hub cap, which did tend to hurt the look to most individuals. When Tamiya themselves even released their reactive armor version, they abandoned that wheel design to the one that we really have here. The difference between Academy and Tamiya though is with the tire rim. The Tamiya unit, just is your standard configuration for a plastic molecule where the rubber tire is integrally molded onto the wheel rim. What Academy went ahead and did was, was something that in my opinion was really ahead of its time, where they made the hub and the rubber tire two separate castings. 
Here we have the kit supplied runner for the rubber tires, which lo and behold are actually made from real rubber. This is actually, and gotta keep in mind, this is something that was completely groundbreaking of this period in this scale. If, you know, we're going back to the late 1980s, early 1990s, if you had ran into tooling like this, that was generally on a 116 scale tank, like the Tamiya Sherman or the Leopard, I believe, Leopard 1 had a similar feature. But in 135th scale, that just wasn't a thing. Academy really was one of the first to actually do this, and I believe their Merkavas of the same period did the same thing. Now, fast forward to today. Some kits are doing this, I guess some super kits, but by and large, this is really something that's not really seen very often. So seeing it on a model as old as this tooling's here, it's actually pretty interesting. The remainder of the kit is just, again, basic Academy. Green plastic tooling. The detailing is average, you know, it's, again, it's what is basically standard and the tooling hasn't really changed on their current re-releases of these kits even today. Here goes your set of reactive armor. Of course, this will be added once the vehicle slides into paint. You can see the detailing on the reactive armor panels. Note they all have their little fasteners on them, which is you know, a nice touch. Some more road wheels and the return rollers. And here goes a runner that supplies you with more options. Here we have the drive sprockets. I believe these ones are the correct width ones, but I guess I'll find out uh, on another M60 build, I guess, down the road. Uh, one other interesting int fitting that is only found on the Academy kit and is not found on the Tamiya ones are the searchlight. The Tamiya kit gives you the Xenon searchlight, which is just a carryover and it's really an appendix from their old original release from the 1970s. The Academy kit, however, gives you the smaller version of the searchlight, which is actually quite rare. In fact, you don't really see the real one of this pattern around today, but there were several examples that are seen in photographs. The detailing on the unit is nicely done. And if it wasn't for the fact that this one's getting the reactive armor and the bulldozer blade, I probably would have opted for something with the searchlight, but perhaps something on a future video, perhaps. And towards the bottom of the box, here we have, running around loose, one of the Tamiya pattern of sprockets from the 70s. Note that these sprockets here are considerably poorer in quality compared to the ones that are even supplied with this own kit. But again, this is these sprockets here are really nothing more than an appendix from the original Tamiya release from the 70s. And again, since many of the runners are derived from the Tamiya tooling, this guy here is just a carryover from that kit. So in one kit, you actually have enough parts to assemble three patterns of sprockets, which you know, I guess could come in handy for a rainy day if you encounter a broken kit and just want to get it up and running again. And one of the key differences on this kit compared to the other versions is the M9 dozer blade. Now, this here was actually a standalone bit of equipment and was sold as an aftermarket kit by Academy during the mid and late 1990s, where this setup here can be fitted to just about any M60 or M48 patent kit on the market. And to put things into perspective, <laughs> you had what, the Eshi, the Tamiya and the Academy renditions of the M60, and really the Tamiya and Academy versions of the M48, M4085 in Academy parlance. The kits themselves were nicely engineered. They are fully functional. They can go up and down and assemble fairly easily. In the bottom of the box, we have some sections of track. Now they're your typical single piece vinyl track links which was a standard on these M60s. Now the Academy kit gave you the octagonal pattern. And if you notice why I have three sets, well, that's because one of the tracks, which one is it, that came with this model here, ah, was deformed. This came like that from the factory. I guess I just got a lucky one. And this one here, it doesn't, at first you're not gonna notice it, but it is short by one link. Now, if the model was static, theoretically, I guess I could just snip off the top one here and put the unit on, but because it's motorized, that's not gonna be the case. So 
I actually had a second set of tracks on hand from, I believe, an eBay auction, so I'm able to fully equip one of these models. I tried actually memory serves contacting MRC, which is the US distributor for the Academy kits, and that fell through because for some reason or another they didn't want to. I believe they weren't importing this particular rendition of the M60, and because of that they couldn't supply me with the new track. Although they were importing the Academy M60. Policies, you know, you gotta love them. And going down further, takes us to the decals, water slide decals, nothing really much to write home about. Uh, they should be decent quality. Of course, once the build comes to the end, I'll be able to find out firsthand if they're crap or not. And these are just some extra parts of the Tamiya gearbox, including the grease and other options that are on that kit as well. Now from there, this brings us to the upper hull, and this is where the build went in a dead stop mode. Now you would think that motorized converting the model here is really where the hardest hurdle would be, and if you guess that, you would be wrong. That's just not the case. The problem came with, well, the M9 dozer. Before I go over there, you can see the tooling on the upper. On the lower section here, one of the things that were missing on the Academy kit, I guess, was this little tab, which is used to clip onto the piece here found on the grow work, which holds the top deck in place. This one here is just a resin copy of a Tamiya one that I <laughs> had on hand, and the resin one works just as good at the job at hand. Just like with the Tamiya kit, the hatch does open. And I believe I replaced the molded, in, or I should say the supplied plastic rod with a metal one, just for, I guess, better functionality. And simple mod doesn't really do too much. The M9 dozer blade also supplies you with a set of elevated US AFV headlights, as well as a redesigned brush guard, as well as a few other fittings on the turret that I'll mention later. And that's really it. Now, this is where, like I said before, the N9 dozer blade made the project go dead stop. On the N9 dozer blade, you have a hydraulic reservoir, which would have been needed to operate the hydraulics on the blade. Now the kit does not supply you with any sort of extra fittings. They just give you the blade, a few other attachment type fittings, and that is it. What you're missing is actually a key important piece, and like I said before, it's the hydraulic reservoir. On the real vehicle, let me get the upper and lower hulls back together to show in more depth. Now with the upper and lower hulls back together again, you can see how the system would work. On the real M60, there would be a hydraulic pump patched into the main diesel engine, and on this little axis panel here, you would have two little elbows which emerged. And these are for the return and for the hydraulic reservoir. One of the lines would run directly under the vehicle's hull to the M9 dozer, to this little box that we have here. Then the second line would, again, emerge from the box, run along the bottom of the hull, and pop up into this little section here over the fender, where we would have a large box and this tube canister, which would have been, on the real vehicle, the hydraulic reservoir. Now, this bit of detailing is absolutely crucial if you're building the model with the M9 dozer blade. Now, unfortunately, the kit does not give you any of the, this detailing here because the kit, again, is just recycling the upper and lower hull tooling from the original basic M60A1 release. Now, which is not a terrible idea. It's one way companies get to stretch out their kit's tooling and offer many, many variants. And for 99% of the M60 hull variants out there, this works perfectly fine. But with the M9 dozer blade, that's just not the case. Now, on the original Tamiya slash Academy tooling, you would have had a box located in this section over here, just like we see it on this side, where it's a box and you just glue this lid on and call it a day. But for this model here, that wasn't going to be the case, so the box had to have been amputated, which did require a little bit of work. Note the amount of plastic that <clears throat> excuse me, is molded into this section here. This is quite a substantial amount of material that needs to be removed and needs to be removed evenly. Can't stress that enough. So with a Dremel, with a high speed removal tool, I carefully by hand just went ahead and milled away the unnecessary, or the I should say the unwanted material. 
Keep in mind, at the time this was done, this air filter box here was not installed. I cannot stress that enough, which gave it plenty of free space for me to work with. Now, another bit of detailing that needs to be replaced is, you know, notice the little support strut that we have here. Now, on the M60, there are these arms that come out and support the fenders to the lower hull. And on the Academy tooling, it is a bit on the, on the more basic end compared to what they're really supposed to look like. And if you see the Dragon rendition of the M60, you'll know what I'm talking about. But for this model here, just for continuity's sake, I went ahead and fabricated to mirror the molded in ones that are found on this kit. Now on the original one, the molded in, I should say the, the support strap is actually an internally molded directly to this box here. So when the box was removed, the piece was also eliminated. Once everything was removed with some sandpaper, I polished everything nice and smooth. Now, I believe there was a small little hole that was found in, in the rear section over here. Again, just with the way the pieces are molded. This was plugged up with, a, with some epoxy and I did a little bit of body work on it, leaving for a nice flawless appearance that we have here. Here you can see on the bottom, a little bit of the epoxy showing through. The support strap was just fabricated out of a piece of plastic strip, again, to keep continuity with the other quality detailed ones that are on the model. Now, this is where the model, of course, went dead stop because the remainder of the reservoir detailing needs to have been scratch built. Now, I was in the process of scratch building it. Probably find the attempt here. Ah, here it is. I was in the process of scratch building it. This was made from two Dragon air filters and you can see where I was going with it, but I just never got around to finishing it specifically with my the rest of my workload, with which is casting orders for 1.6 scale tank parts and 1.16 builds and 1.6 builds and, 1 6 scale builds and with all of the more pressing builds and jobs I had going on, scratch building this guy here just wasn't as important. So the kit just went back in its box and stayed in an open state in the corner of the shop for a number of years until really until uh, a week or so ago where I decided to, to take it and finish it off. I'm cleaning up the shop. I kind of need space. So might as well finish the build off, right? And well, it's a good thing I went ahead and set the model aside because one thing that has changed a lot lately with my builds is with the material. Rather than scratch building this piece, I decided to make a new one from 3D prints. And that is exactly what I have here. In this bag, I went ahead and developed my own patent system oil hydraulic fluid reservoir, which has all of the small detailing, which I would have to scratch build with other means on the other piece that I was working on. It just drops directly in place. And now you can see exactly how the system would look. We have the main reservoir body here, which is this little, which is this box structure with all the fasteners, which will be lift rings as well as filler spouts, as well as this tube structure here, which I guess is against some part of the reservoir system. Now, trying to fabricate all of this with old school scratch method methods is of course doable, but it is more time consuming, I found then just sitting there in front of a computer and just laying everything out in CAD. With the piece being 3D printed, it's just ready to go out of the bag. Now I do have to fabricate some pieces, namely a little support strut that comes out of the bottom here, makes contact with the fender. You could say, well, you could have done that in CAD, but it was hard trying to get everything with its proper proportions and trying to match it with this curvature here is a little bit more complicated than it sounds. So I figured it's probably easier to make it out of a piece of strip aluminum. Plus it's also stronger out of aluminum too. Keep in mind, this does have to have the ability to come off the hull if there's an emergency. Now, in addition to the reservoir, I also made the little, Let's get them to pour them out. Here we go. I also made the little hydraulic elbow pieces, which would emerge from that axis cap that I mentioned before. So no scratch building is required for those. I could just use some thin wires to substitute for the hydraulic lines and I should have everything that I need. 
Now, another design cue that I'm going to have to incorporate is having the tubes unplug in some way, shape, or form. Again, because the tubes are connected to the lower hull, the reservoir is on the top, and for maintenance or access, I am going to have to make the pieces somehow disengage. But more information on that is to be developed, I suppose. Now, on the turret itself, one last thing to point out is, besides all the dust which will need to be washed off, you can see I even went ahead and added some photo etch mesh to the gypsy rack, replacing the stock mesh work that is supplied with all of these Tamiya and Academy kits. The, the photo etch mesh always does look a lot better in its final form compared to the kit supply ones. I mean, the kit supply one's okay, it gets you, you know, it does do the job, but the PE mesh is, in my opinion, a much higher quality piece. And here's the model now ready to paint. Currently sitting in queue next to it is another Tamiya M60A1 that is actually on the tail end of its build, but more information on that is actually discussed in another YouTube video, which by the time this video drops, this guy here should already be available, and the link is going to be in the video description below. Not going to go too much into that, but it's actually pretty interesting and worth a watch. For this guy here, you can see now the last of the final details that have been added to get the model up to this point. With the turret off, here you can see the reservoir detailing now mounted. It just drops directly into place. I went ahead and fabricated a little support out of thin strip of, of aluminum. And here you can see the two elbows which emerge from the rear section here of the M60's hull. Now, you can also see how the rest of the plumbing is connected and it could look a little confusing but it's actually pretty simple. Specifically if anyone has ever worked on heavy equipment like a bulldozer or an excavator before, the plumbing should be very familiar to you. Okay, like I said before, on the inside here of the grill work would be the hydraulic pump patched into the engine. That would then leave this little tube here. It runs on the bottom portion of the tank. And yes, on the tanks that were equipped with the bulldozer blade, the hydraulic lines were completely exposed. There wasn't any shielding anything on them. I guess they figured the likelihood of anything happening to them is, was going to be pretty remote. Now, you can see on the model here, they're just two little, or I should say a bunch of little segments which help connect it to the hull. And on the real vehicle, they would be these large flange type systems and they would be welded to the bottom portion of the vehicle. But it, the tube emerges then enters into the bottom portion here of this box. This box here is then what's used to power the hydraulic rams for the plow. The return then leaves this section, runs again along on the bottom, and then this guy here enters into the reservoir found on the back. Another tube leaves the reservoir and heads back into the hydraulic pump via the other tube. It looks pretty confusing, but it's fairly simple and does give the model a lot of extra detailing compared to just building it out of the box where it has your traditional M60A1 detailing, which is inaccurate for a vehicle with this setup. This, by the way, is also true for the M48 that also had the same modification made to it. Now, that wraps up the hydraulic system, but not the last of the detailing. If you notice here on the front, we have a new piece added which is a piece of brass that connects these two locks together and on the real unit this would be the travel locks for the the plow if it goes all the way up these sections here these hooks will then click onto these small little units keeping the blade in its stowed mode and the driver of the vehicle would actually go ahead and disconnect it by pulling on this little latch now the latch is just made from pieces of styrene, while the other components are made from brass and soldered wire. Now, if you notice, the piece is actually not permanently affixed to the model. And the reason for that, again, has to do with the motorization. If I ever have to get access to the model, this entire brass piece just simply pops right off, like you see. Now, the plow is actually firmly and permanently attached to the lower hull. I did some experiments and found out that trying to make the plow disconnect is really not that necessary. So I was able to be able to get access to the malt without having to remove these sections, which makes my life a little bit easier. Now the 
crossbar here is only held on via friction and just slides directly into place. Perhaps I might add a little drop of white glue on it just to really keep it where it needs to be and prevent it from wiggling around as the model ages and also as the model is driven periodically. Now there were two holes that I drilled in the bottom for fasteners. These are going to be plugged and deleted with some bodywork which will come directly after the filming of this take. Starting with the model's lower hull and the suspension, like I said before in the model start portion of the video, the Academy's tooling is basically just a product improved, roided up variant of the Tamiya tooling. And because of that, you will have the some of the attributes found on the Tamiya kits present on this kit here. Namely, with the lower hull, it will be the sections over here where you have these curved portions which need to be glued to the bottom pan. Now this is something which is basically seen on just about every M60 variant or even M48 pack and kit that I've had the opportunity to work on in this scale. And on the Academy kit it's no different. Just basic body work is all that's required in order to blend in the seam work found in these two locations over here. The remainder of the swing arm and suspension components, again, stock out of the box. Nothing really much to talk about. They clean up and install very quickly and effortlessly, and the instructions are pretty well thought out on these Academy kits, and basically you can just assemble the model without too many headaches to worry about, outside of, of course, the seam work that I just mentioned. Now from there it takes us to the row wheels. Now like I showcased earlier, the row wheels on this kit are very unique in that the center hub is a separate piece from the tire which is molded in a flexible rubber material. Just like I said earlier, this is actually a very nice feature found on this generation of kit. Now, if anyone is wondering if this is found on all of the Academy kits, well, the answer is no. These, this type of design on the row wheels was something that was introduced by Academy and I want to say the mid-1990s time frame, but is a feature that Academy has frequently introduced and dropped throughout the various iterations and releases of this exact same kit. Now, if you encounter one of these Academy kits in the wild and are unsure on which type of tooling that the kit has, this is something that you're gonna have to pay attention to because this feature is generally mentioned on the box either in a small print section on the front or possibly on a side panel where the kit goes over a quick blurb on what the contents are and as well as its features. Now, if you do encounter one of these kits, these tires here are actually a really nice feature, and that's something I'm gonna stick by. Now, when it comes to the actual road wheel design, Academy went with the stamped sheet metal rendition of the patent road wheels. This is the same type of design which was utilized on many other American tanks from the M48 patent series, and even the M47. Now, when the M60 was first developed, one of the hallmarks of the design was the replacement of this pattern of row wheel with one made from an all-cast aluminum alloy. Now, although the cast aluminum wheels were quite prolific and were used extensively, it is not uncommon to find M60A1s with the older stamped steel wheels like we have here. With the US military being what it is, they had a humongous back stockpile of this pattern of wheels on their inventory, so it's not uncommon again to see vehicles even during this late era with the earlier pattern wheels. Now in case anyone is wondering, there is a replacement aftermarket set for the aluminum wheels that are offered by Armor Scale. The Armor Scale wheels are a direct replacement for the stamped metal wheels that are found on the Academy kit or on the Tamiya M60A1 kit. The armor scale wheels I've utilized on a couple past builds that I've showcased on the channel and like I said in those videos, they are highly recommended. But for this model here, that's not going to be the case. First and foremost, because this model is motorized, the wheels still have to function and that's not going to be possible with the armor scale set. And going back to what I said before, another reason why I didn't see the need to change the wheels was because, well, I really like the design of the wheels on this kit. Also, with the tires being rubber, this again helps with the model being motorized because as the model is driven, you're not going to have to worry about any paint or chips or scratches found on the rubber tires that are going to 
get wear as the model is run because again, the pieces are their L natural material. So it's just another benefit factor. And just like I said before, it's the same type of thing that you see on more higher end 116 scale RC builds. From the wheels now take us to the sprocket and the sprocket like I mentioned before needed a modification because for some strange reason the versions that I used from the one runner were too narrow and wouldn't fit the stock track. The pieces were widened and now that they're fully painted look completely undistinguishable from the other sets. Also, like I may have mentioned before, the mud slits are absent on this build because, again, there were several foundries that made these components for the U.S. military that omitted the mud slit. So, it's one of those features that is not necessarily inaccurate for your build. And whether or whether or not you want to add this detailing is really left up to your discretion. For this build, however, I just simply left them off. From the sprocket, this now takes to the track. Now, the track on this vehicle here is your standard non-directional octagonal pattern track, which is very common on the M60 A1 tank family. The tracks themselves that are supplied by the Academy kit are nicely done. They're basically nothing more than carbon copies of the Tamiya tracks, which includes the exact same type of detailing, the same type of features, and are made in a material which is very similar. Albeit on the Academy versions, the rubber is a slightly stiffer material compared to the ones on the Tamiya. Now like I stated before, one of the tracks which was supplied with the kit could not have been utilized because of a deformation found on one of the link sections where half of the link was actually partly molded. Now I did try to contact MRC, which is a distributor for the Academy kits in the United States, and they were less than cooperative with trying to replace the deformed track that I had. Trying to get replacement tracks from Academy themselves, it's a bit problematic due to just the geographic and language barriers. But luckily for me on this build here, I was able to scrounge a spare set of tracks that I had floating around my spare parts bin, and I simply just dusted off the bands and utilized them on this build here. Now, in case anyone's wondering, is this a common reoccurring problem that is found on these Academy kits? The answer is a resounding no. This model here, is quite frankly a, a fluke and I guess I just got stuck with the short and the stick on this one. In the past I've done lots of these Academy builds from their releases from the 1980s, 1990s and even from the 2000s era and this was the first time I've ever encountered this type of a problem. Having said that this type of problem can also occur to any other plastic kit company that has tooling with this type of material such as Tamiya, even Italori. Now, in case anyone does end up with the short end of the stick like I did and are wondering what they can do for replacement tracks, for the M60, there are a few options available. First, it doesn't hurt to try your luck with dealing with MRC and or Academy. You may get lucky and somehow, some way, get the right person who sees the part that you need and replaces it. But if that doesn't yield any results, try hitting up eBay where it's not uncommon to see these tracks get posted from time to time from people who have a spare set on hand. Another option would be to replace the rubber tracks altogether and go with a set of workable track links from AFV Club. The workable AFV Club track links come in the same pattern that we have here and are a nice bit of kit. They assemble very easily and are quite affordable. I've used them on a few other builds in the past and again, they are definitely worth the money and worth your time. I would definitely check them out in case you run into this problem. And also another benefit of the AFV Club links is that they time absolutely perfectly with the stock Academy or even Timmy's Rockets. Now for the way the tracks are actually painted, this is something that I frequently mention in these videos. Now for the octagonal version of the track, it's comprised of like with many other American tanks, metal and rubber components. And the trick is knowing which one is which. You'll notice that on all of the metal parts that we have here, I painted them in a rust type material. And this would be very commonly seen on vehicles, not only with this track, but also from this type of era. At this point here, towards the end of its service life, the M60's running gear was really starting to show its age and would definitely be 
a common sight to see the tracks with their metal in a rust type condition. For the rubber pads, you'll notice that on the inside portion of the track, right here, they are painted in a black coloring that have some wear on them. And on the exterior portion of the track, you'll notice the octagonal inserts are left in their rubber coloring as well. But unlike the Chevron tracks, which came out before this, where the whole face was actually rubber, with the octagonal links, the face was metal, and it had this little recess found on the metal track where the octagonal link would get fixed and bolted on the inside. So if anyone is working on an M60 or an M4885 with this pattern of track, keep that in mind in terms of the painting and the weathering. This is something that can easily be done and can also easily hurt the look of your build if painted incorrectly. Brings us to the hydraulic pump and reservoir system that I showcased before. But now you can see everything thoroughly painted and weathered and how it just fills into the vehicle. And here's the printing seen from the top view. Note now that everything is painted how much easier the fastener and filler cap detailing can be seen. Note that on the model here I went ahead and weathered it by having some of the oil stains and drips which would undoubtedly be seen on the real counterpart and it definitely helps with the models weather work. Now in case anyone out there watching this video has this exact same kit in their stash and are looking to upgrade the missing detailing for the reservoir as well as the elbows, or if you have the standalone Academy M9 Dozer kit and are looking to mount that to some other vehicle, be another M60 or even a M48 Patton, this set here is being listed for sale. However, unlike the other parts that are mentioned in these videos that I do in which those get posted to the ECA catalog because this item here is 135th scale this is not a scale that I actively produce components for. Instead this component along with the elbows are posted on my Shapeway store account which can be accessed via the link listed below in the video description. Now the sets only consist of the 3D printed components that I showcased earlier which would again include the box and the reservoir system and the plumbing elbows. The other components, which would include the support brace, the plumbing tubes, and the tube supports that we have here on the bottom, all need to be scratch built by you, the builder, in one form or another. From the hydraulic system brings us to the star of the show, which is the M9 dozer blade. Now, the unit itself is primarily built out of the box, but I did add some scratch build details, namely the travel lock disengagement lever that we have here on the front. If we recall, this was fabricated out of a piece of brass tube and metal wire, and I also had to fabricate the little grab handle that is found on the front section in front of the driver's hatch. These details are absent on the stock Academy kit. Now the M9 dozer blade is somewhat functional in that you can display it either in the up mode like I have here or in its downward state. Now the unit does have its travel lock detailings present both on these two locations here on the bottom as well as these two hooks here on the top. Now the hooks are free floating, they're not permanently glued in place and theoretically you can make the piece latch on. But to do so, you are gonna to have to do some hand fitting to some of the components. When the piece is up, you'll see that trying to get it to the locked position is gonna be a bit problematic. Again, it's something that can be done, but you are going to have to sacrifice the functionality of the part. So you have one of two options if you're working on one of these kits. Either you can have it permanently affix in the travel locked mode. This is probably something you want to do maybe for a diorama. Or you could do like the way I did this build here where you just have the bulldozer blade off the travel lock which allows you to display it either in the up or in the down position. Either way will be perfectly suffice for you but it's one of those things where you can have to make up your mind as once you go with the travel lock mode, there's no going back. Moving up from the M9 dozer blade takes it to the brush guards and the, and the headlights. This is one aspect of the kit that's actually pretty unique. You'll notice that because of the dozer blade, the brush guard design was completely redesigned compared to the ones found on the standard M60A1. 
In addition to that, the headlights are also elevated in order to clear the bulldozer blade equipment that we have here. All of these components, I believe, were stocked with the kit and were just simply mounted as is. From the front hull area, this now takes us to the reactive armor plating. Now, the reactive armor plating found on the Academy kit are nicely rendered. On the rear sections, you have the box frame system, which would be used to secure the tiles to the turret and the hull. These are integrally molded and require no assembly. On their face, you'll notice all of the fastener work present. And another nice feature is that where the tiles are clustered together, the Academy kit has some nice deep grooves and seams that are found, which really does give the appearance that the pieces are separate components that are just tiled next to each other. The Academy kit also gives you a couple options of the styles of the bricks in a few of the locations, as apparently there were more than one rendition of the bricks for this pattern of vehicle. Now, unfortunately, I cannot compare the Academy rendition to the Tamiya or the TACOM as I've yet to actually build a M60 with the ERA. In fact, this is my very first go around at this particular vehicle, specifically in 135th scale. But rest assured, if I ever do one of those other vehicles, I could definitely compare and contrast the different styles of the ERA. Now, after building this model here, you can definitely see that the addition of the ERA set was more or less an add-on done after the fact by Academy. And what I mean by that is specifically with the turret, you're really left on your own with trying to figure out where the panels need to go. On the hull, it's relatively easy because on these two sections here of the fender work, there's a small little crease line which are found on these two areas, which if you're building the vehicle without the ERA, you simply just polish away with some sandpaper and you're good to go. But if you're adding the ERA, it gives you a good guideline on where the two sections are fitted. And they're important because if they are not mounted in the right locations, the turret is going to make contact with these plates. But on the turret, you're left completely guessing. When it comes time to actually build the model, you're going to be looking at the instructions where they have numbers pointing to areas of the turret, and you're basically left trying to copy what the picture basically has. Oddly enough, this is more or less just like on the real vehicle because that's exactly how these ERAs were fitted. They just gave the soldiers a box full of box frames and told them where to weld them and tack them to the side of the turret. And hopefully it all worked out. That's generally what you're going to be experiencing when doing one of these kits. It's not like something you would see on a newer kit where on the inside they would have holes. Like to me is no notorious for doing this where you have A, B, C and on the instructions they tell you where to drill out. On this model here, that's not the case. You're just going to basically be left with a monkey see, monkey do type situation. Another aspect to the ERA that you have to keep in mind of is that some of the other turret detail fittings need to be removed in order to mount on the ERA. So you do have to pay good attention to the instructions. Now the instructions to their credit do mention this, but it's something that you do have to pay attention to and you can easily overlook it, like what happened to yours truly. If we recall on the section of the video when the model was just ready for painting, you'll notice I had the grab handles here affixed to the side of the turret. Well, if you're going with the ERA route, these need to be amputated and replaced outright. Another thing to keep aware of the ERA is with the vehicle's paintwork. Now, of course, you're going to have to add this after the vehicle is fully painted. That's the only way you're going to get the tank with its camouflage and then with the ERA mounted on top of it. Trying to get that camo on there and get the ERA thoroughly painted, I don't just see how that's possible. And why that's important is, again, because of the amorphous layout that you're going to have to basically piece these pieces together on. If you're gluing them on without any clue on where they go beforehand, you're going to have some bad glue sections that you're going to have to contend with. I strongly recommend, when it comes time to building the tank and adding the ERA, presumably after the vehicle is fully painted and weathered, you're going to need to dry fit it on first. Make sure you're good to go and then you commit to the adhesives. It's one of those things where you need to measure twice and cut once because if you don't, you're going to have a messed up paint job in a 
short amount of time. Now, while on the ERA, some of the other fittings that are supplied with the kit that are nice additions are the little grab handles that we have here on the turret roof. There is also a small little, I have no idea what this little device is, but this again has to do something with the ERA. And we also have a ERA dedicated mantlet. Now this is a nice touch because this does cut out a lot of the guesswork required for this piece here. The mantlet on the kit supplies you with two versions. One, just a standard M68-1 mantlet. And the other one, like we've seen on, on the pre-paint version, has small little dimples that are molded in, specifically for alignment of the ERA plates. Which, by the way, I gotta say, doing an ERA for the first time, it literally just seems like they just try to stick as many post-it notes, almost, to the side of the vehicle as possible to see what sticks and where there's clearance. It's kind of funny how it, it looks really ungangly, but you can see what they were going with trying to cover up as much open space as possible with this device. I will say though that once the units are mounted and mounted correctly, they will not make any contact with the other details found on the vehicle. Finally on the ERA, you'll notice that with the M9 dozer blade attached, you're not going to put the armor plates on the front plate that we have here as well as the front bottom hull section that we have here. Obviously because of the M9 dozer blade equipment. From there this now brings us to the remainder of the turret. Now in addition to the grab handles like I mentioned before, another change that gets added when you add the ERA is with the flare box. Normally the flare box as well as a jerry can are located on the upper corners over here of the rear portion of the bustle and the jerry cans usually on either side here of the turret. Once you go with the ERA, that's no longer going to be the case. The little flare boxes are mounted on the side portions here of the air cleaner boxes. And for the jerry cans, I just mounted them here on the gypsy rack. From there, this now brings us to the crew hatches. Now, on this model here, I went ahead and modified the kit tooling in order to make the hatches fully functional. Normally, the kit requires you to have this as an option, either have them closed or in the open state. The model does have some basic interior detailing on the hatches, and on this version here I just painted the small headrest. The units were drilled out with a pin vise, and a small metal pin was added to secure the hinge feature. It's a nice, quick, simple modification that, again, I like to typically do on these patent-based vehicles. So on this model here, in addition to the bow hatch being functional, so are the two turret ones. From the hatches, this now brings us to the mini turret slash cupola. Now, this is one aspect of the Academy kit where it's definitely more improved compared to the earlier Tamiya rendering. If we look over here, we have a little disc with rivets in it, as well as other fasteners. And on the real vehicle, this would be used to secure the mantlet for the machine gun in place. On the Tamiya tooling, this is absent and normally needs to be replaced with a piece of photo etch. But on the Academy kit, it's integrally molded into the plastic tooling. Another bit of detailing that Academy added to the mini turret are these three lift rings that we have here. These units are absent on the Tamiya model, but come standard on the Academy kit. Now, the Academy kit's pieces are nicely molded. They're very fine with their overall moldings, but because of this they are going to be a bit on the frail side. So a lot of care needs to be exhibited by the builder when handling these parts. Fortunately, if you do end up breaking one, they're not hard to replicate. With a pin vise and a small little bit of floor wire, you can easily drill small holes into the turret and bend pieces of metal, replicating these pieces exactly. Well, from there, this now brings us to the paint and the markings. For the model's paint work, I went with a three-tone NATO camouflage pattern, which would have been found on M60s from the late 1980s up until its retirement in the early to mid-1990s. Now, you'll notice that the vehicle does not have any markings on it because, frankly, the decals were a weak point on this kit. I don't know if it had to do with the age of the model or just the decals in general were just low quality. The decals themselves did go on to the model. They didn't Thanos snap out of existence or anything like I've seen on some of the Eshi kits, but the quality of the, of the markings just really weren't that good. So rather than trying to work with 
them, I just simply omitted them entirely from the model. Now, I did touch upon this briefly before when I was talking about the ERA being painted separately because it is not uncommon to see the vehicles of this type that have the ERA not matching the rest of the paint scheme. In fact, I think it's rare to see that as being the case. Now, for this model here, one nice thing about this kit, even with the ERA fitted, is that you can add the ERA to a multitude of different paint schemes. I've even seen renditions of the M60A1 with Merc camouflage schemes with the ERA being fitted to it, which is pretty unique. Not to mention the ubiquitous Desert Storm variant of this exact same vehicle with the M9 with the ERA found for US Marine Corps use. Now, obviously you can also build the vehicle sans the ERA, which opens it up to even more possibilities from standard OD to a master scheme to basically all the other paint variations for this vehicle type that are under the sun. Well, without further ado, let me go ahead and take this model off of this turntable here, put them on the ground, and let's just see how well this model runs. In the end, I'm really happy on how this build turned out. This was one of those projects that, for one reason or another, just kept on getting postponed and postponed and just lingered and lingered and lingered and finally having it built <laughs> and ready for display in the collection is definitely one that I am very glad to finally see come. And in a way, it's actually a good thing because, like I mentioned before, with the oil reservoir system, trying to scratch build that unit in the past, the piece would not nearly have been as good as the way you see it on this model here. So in the long run, it was actually a good thing that the build was delayed. But huh, it, that doesn't take away the really gratifying feeling to knowing that I finally beat this kit and it's now ready for display in the collection. From there, this now brings us to skill level and recommendation. Now, with the base kit being the Academy M60A1, which, like I said in numerous times in this video, is nothing more than a roided up Tamiya M60A1 kit, this model here is normally good for beginners. However, with the added complexity of the M9 dozer blade and with the reactive armor set, this model here I can't really recommend to a beginner. This kit with the extra features that I just mentioned is really more or less meant for an intermediate to an advanced range builder. Where this kit shines is it for somebody who already built the Tamiya or the Academy M60A1 and are looking to level up but are not really ready to tackle something more elaborate like the AFV Club M60A1 family or even the Dragon M60 kits. This guy here is a nice way to dip your toe into the more complex kit waters, so to speak. In my opinion, the Academy M60A1 kit built into a very nice representation of this vehicle. However, having said that, a lot of the kit's features and detailing are going to be considered more primitive compared to the other contemporary kits that are on the market. Some of these kits would include the versions from TACOM, AFV Club, and Dragon. However, unlike those vehicles that I just mentioned, the Academy kits are going to be more affordable in comparison and are also going to be easier to put together. Now, although it's theoretically possible to build this rendition out of the other vehicles that I just mentioned, but to do so, ironically, you are going to be needing the M9 Dozer Blade, which Academy offered as an aftermarket set, or you're going to be tracking down one of the resin sets from Legends. However, when it comes to an out-of-the-box, all plastic kit, the Academy version is still the only one in the market. Now having said all that, probably the biggest glaring detailed ding that this kit does have was the kit's omission of the oil reservoir like I mentioned before. Now I'm not going to lie, this bit of equipment does require a lot of elbow grease exhibited by the builder in order to first delete and amputate all of the molded and detailing found on that section there as well as some other skill sets in having to replace and 
resurface the area with body work and other techniques in order to get it prepped for the new replacement part that I also mentioned in the previous scene. However, with or without the reservoir, the vehicle does build up into a very unique and a mostly obscure variant of the M60 family. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale M60A1 Rise main battle tank with the M9 dozer blade. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content, be it small scale model showcase video like this guy over here, or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted on this channel. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been posted on the channel in the past. Finally, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Till next time.